how we can be flexible. It's important to understand that coaching and mentoring is a flexible discipline. Now, in my experience of working across a broad range of areas, be it sport, business, in education, it's quite useful to be able to have a degree of flexibility in the environment you're in. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I've had situations where I've been in football and just walking through the corridor of the club. You have a conversation with a, a footballer, for example, or, or an athlete, because that's the only time you've got outside their commitments of doing media work and other coaches they've got to see, the physio they've got to see, do an interview for the TV and or the radio. And, and you've got this sort of time frame, this sort of time frame where you, you think, well, with the time I've got, I'm going to do the very best I can to help the person be the best they can. So you're thinking that in your mind, and this applies in business too, where sometimes even you know, you're going up an elevator or you know, walking down a flight of stairs. Um, and even in education sometimes, you're sort of teaching a group of people, uh, learners, students, and you have a moment where, you know, be it at lunchtime, or you're going for a walk. Or, so there's a degree of flexibility. Um, coaching are likely uses for models of practice and process work in a variety of situations. So you have a lot of models we've covered throughout the course and you've covered on many other courses. Now, it's not one size fits all that we know. Um, time scales are adjustable and can involve a few minutes in the corridor to half an hour or an hour long one-to-one -one session. Okay, so you might be told, you're sitting there in business, tapping on your computer, and, and you get told, HR wants to see you for an hour. <laughs> and you're wondering, what do they want to see me for? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and, and then you, you see the friendly face of, <laughs> and you're okay. Um, but the point being is, uh, you know, from a managerial perspective, the manager can be invited to, to sit in or lead a team in a coaching session. So the manager gets invited, can you come in and, and facilitate the, the session? Okay, and there are various models to do that. The pathway to coaching, and it's not a pathway that's inflexible, you know, you might go from one to the other to the other, but some of the key fundamentals in pathways to coaching are to establish a conversation. And that involves getting rapport, creating an atmosphere, a climate, we want to identify a topic or goal. So one would agree while well, you'll talk about the specifics of the conversation, uh, the agree a desired outcome. So what are you wanting from the session, if that makes sense? Okay, uh, and then we want to get a, a surface understanding and insight, encourage inquiry, build mutual understanding, enable knowledge and values to surface to focus towards a solution what would be better, the solution, okay? Shape agreements and conclusions. Summarize ideas, concepts. And there was a perfect example when I did the session yesterday, you can't be volunteer. Um, so we sort of, we did that, we established a goal, okay? In an informal way, not a formal way. Um, we got understanding of what was going on at a deeper level, okay? Then we summarized what to do going forward, uh, specific action what to do. So here's the task to go forward. Um, and then we sort of completion and closure, uh, summarize. So that's a, a, as a general rule, and we sort of can come back to that. I can send you some details on that anyway, that we sort of follow. But you want to identify a clear topic or goal. Uh, and that's sort of the second stage after you've got rapport. Okay? This stage creates a sense of purpose and direction for the conversation. So that you know where you need to be heading. You've got a clear direction for the conversation. That's flexible in the sense that you can divert and digress if need be and necessary. Okay? Uh, in the co case of the coachee has the objective in mind for the conversation, so the coach needs to identify objectives for discussion from su so subordinate. Um, so as a coach manager, some tips and some important points that you need to do, well, you don't necessarily need to do, but some things I'll sort of share with you, is encourage your colleague to own the session by declaring what they want from it. So what are you wanting from the session? So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are we on that? Identify the purpose and topic for the session. So what's the purpose? What's the topic? Uh, in sufficient detail, has been able to facilitate the conversation towards an effective outcome. 
Okay? Establish the conditions to keep the conversations on track using effective questioning. So keep, and we're going to show you the demonstration shortly. Um, uh, create a sense of success is possible by focusing on choices, options, and working things out. Identify an end point for the conversation. Or what do you think would happen with the conversation you had an end point? It could go on forever. It could start becoming irrelevant. Um, <coughs> when you reach the way forward and have met objectives, so you get closure. We've done as much as one can do with the time we've got, the situation we're in. Okay? And, and there's a, a number of models you can use and we'll sort of draw attention to those and have done them throughout the course to, to do that, to do just that. There, there's many models you can do. Um, but equally, we think the key to having effective conversation is maintaining the balance between being effective and not frustrating the coachee who may want to launch into something they need to get off their chest. Now, who's been in a situation where someone feels they want to get something off their chest? The person comes in. Okay, they want to get something off their chest. Um, so, example might be, I'll give you an example. Okay, this is a transcript. For confidentiality, that's not the person's real name. Um, okay. Uh, but me being coach in this situation. So, what would you like to talk about? Okay, is the question. For confidentiality, let's say the person's called Sally, well, it's the whole situation with the team and recruitment right now, to be honest. It's a real concern. The issue at the moment is too broad. So, the coach manager needs to effectively question. It's a broad, isn't it, really, in reality? So the coach, okay, specifically, what is it in regard to the team and recruitment you want to talk about? That's the question. Sally says, well, it's just the delays we're getting with hiring. It's taking too long and work is piling up. Now we have a clearer topic, but no goal to work towards. Would you agree? There's no real goal to work towards. This could easily turn into a complaining session. Agreed? Okay, so the coach needs to question to encourage uh, further challenge. So the coach being me, right, that sounds like something we need to do or work through. Uh, think about the next 30 minutes, what do you want to get out of the conversation? So what am I doing by asking that question? I'm steering her back, bringing it back in, okay? Um, Sally, well, I guess I want to tell you what's been going on and maybe get some ideas as to what else I can do. Now then, Sally's starting to own the conversation and it could be tempting for the coach at this stage to rescue her. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So keep in mind when you rescue someone, what do you make out of them? The victim. Do you want that? And, and, and you don't encourage long-term self-awareness and responsibility which is the goal of performance coaching. Okay, is that, we're okay, we're all sort of, okay. So a tip to avoid chest clearing encounters, if we just use that for the sake of simplicity, uh, it's important to encourage your team to prepare for their coaching sessions by forming objectives or purpose before they come in. Okay, so Sally uh, is coming in tomorrow for the session, we've got as far as we can. I want you to go away and draft objectives and purpose. Agree? We agree on, on purpose of the session. Okay? And clear objective. Describe the goal of the coaching session is to move forward with solutions and actions. Would you agree? So we make the most that we got at the time that we've got. Okay? Now then, the practicality of us reaching a solution or moving forward in every situation. Is that idealistic? It may be. It may be. If one is frustrated, they're frustrated, aren't they? There may be things in the environment that I can't control. You can't control or they can't control. Okay? Uh, now, what we can do, as well as some of the models we've talked about that are quite useful to help move people forward, which we'll come back to review and another PDF I've sent you that have many, many models that you can use. One thing we can do as well is uh, maybe we can sort of add, we'll do mindfulness. Now for those of you who don't know, in a nutshell, mindfulness teaching has been going on for many, many years. 
3,500 years. It's got its roots in Hindu teaching. Mindfulness concepts are part of Eastern contemplative practices starting in Buddhism, uh, roughly 535 uh, BCE. Western psychology eventually incorporated the principles of mindfulness with the main distinction with the focus on doing and results instead of being in the journey. So that's the difference between secular mindfulness and uh, Buddhism, with the end result being in secular uh, mindfulness. So let's look at a summary of the research. There is not a tremendous amount of research of mindfulness in business, by the way, and performance, but there is some. I'm going to summarise, saving you a lot of time reading research papers, uh, like I've done over, over a long period of time, of the key points. Okay? So mindfulness can improve performance of individuals and teams in the workplace by focusing on present tasks and values, acting more thoughtfully and with compassion. So now, our coach is a bit more compassionate towards uh, Sally and recognises that she may be frustrated and thinks, well actually, you know what, perhaps getting her to go away and, and focus on maybe a, a grow model, so to speak, without undermining it, might be a little bit, okay, how about we just sort of integrate some of this? Uh, okay, does that make sense? So mindful leaders possess the ability to be self-aware, compassionate, communicate mindfully, embody values, hold multiple perspectives, eliminate distractions and clutter and lead with openness and transparency. Mindfulness training enhance or can enhance the performance of athletes, albeit there's not a great deal of literature out there. If one can be anecdotal and apply the literature in my own experience of working at highest level in sports, um, by focusing the attention on present actions and decisions rather than past mistakes and future goals, attuning one's mind and body, and lessening the distraction of emotional stimuli and intensifying the experiential learning. Could that be transferred to business, do you think? Absolutely, yeah? Mindful meditation improves general well-being by reducing anxiety, stress, and other distress symptoms, improving coping mechanisms from a different perspective. Mindfulness actually, in the beginning, was focused on pain, pain management, by the way, um, and recovery. But it can also strengthen relationships and engage more fully with the present moment. Okay, general well-being can be improved as a general. As a general, if you look at the literature, the, the research, you can you see take eight weeks or so. There's mindfulness-based programs. Okay, now I'm not suggesting you go away and you do uh, a, a program, but there are research and the body of evidence suggests that over over a period of time. Okay. Um, the characteristics that mindful leaders have, okay, now think about mindful leaders, think about leaders that you sort of admire and who are very good at what they do, good leaders, okay, really good leaders, they're compassionate for themselves and others, okay, good leaders have got compassion, aware of their own thoughts and feelings, they've got a high level of self-awareness, their actions are thoughtful, They're focusing attention on values. So they appreciate your values and they're mindful on social interactions. There's some characteristics that aren't exhaustive. Okay, so be, becoming more mindful, you'd like to think that you can improve these areas. If you improve those areas, there's a very good chance you'll be a better leader. If you're a better leader, then there's an impact on the organization you're in. Okay, so mindfulness has Buddhist roots. Uh, a Western secular, also Western secular clinical application. So it begins with Buddhism, but obviously, um, you know, research suggests that benefits include behavior regulation and emotional reactivity. So the way I, I, I regulate my behavior, okay, the way I react, I go from response rather than react. I respond. Okay, rather than react. And that's when I do some work with people who work as, say, in the media and football managers in press conference, it goes from, say, okay, regulating their behaviour. Because if the players in the team see you getting all ruffled, what do you think they're going to feel? How do the players feel if the manager gets ruffled? Yeah, well, they're going to sort of lose belief. Yeah, exactly. So equally in a in corporation, the, the coach. If you go in there and, you know, you're highly neurotic and 
running around like a headless chicken and, and, and how are the staff going to feel? Has this person got things under control? Mm. So there is a case, you know, for one being able to regulate themselves. Um, so one thing about mindfulness consists the, the ability to meditate, how we focus our attention and relate to experiences. Now, if you sort of look from, from a Buddhist perspective, you know, suffering, adversity, and so on and so forth. So how one focuses our attention um, is the key fundamental. And how we relate to experiences, it, it, well, predominantly suffering and adversity. Um, how we focus our attention. And in the modern world, by the way, they may not have had this 4,000 years ago, or well, they may have done for all I know, but it's very unlikely. But now we've got a lot more competing for attention. Okay, so as, as much as you've got the people in your room where you're working, or the person you're working with, there's many other things fighting for attention, isn't there? Okay, and, and that sort of distracts one's mind in one sense. It's not suggesting it's a good or a bad thing, but your mind, what does your mind need to do? Because your mind needs to, 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 to switch off you're consuming a lot of energy by doing that, a lot of metabolic energy as much as you're doing other stuff too, but that's another story for another day um, sort of going off piece a bit this is going off piece to sort of show you the well, just the basics okay, going off piece there's a substantial body of evidence that suggests mindfulness is pain relief, depression, anxiety not that I'm suggesting if you're not sort of qualified in that area, it's not your remit to administer it for that I'm just putting it out there, there's a lot of evidence um, there's not a great deal of evidence of areas of mental health. There is a guy, Chadwick, who's done some stuff on mindfulness and psychosis. Um, if you sort of care to read on that, and it's quite interesting. But he, he sort of shortens the sessions um, and so on and so forth. And we got going into too much detail. Not that I'm recommending someone do mindfulness if they've got psychosis, but there is evidence to suggest that it can work. And if you in that field, you're in therapist, look up Chadwick and you'll see some of his work. But mindfulness is also used outside empirical protocols, as I've mentioned, by variable professional backgrounds and expertise, teachers, coaches, and so on and so forth. Uh, in sport, it can improve performance of individuals in, in, in the workplace too, in leadership. And we mentioned before, we focus on the now in adverse to past mistakes and future outcomes. So we, we're very process oriented. So what do I mean by that? So you might be focusing on your KPI which is external attribution, you can't control it. Can you control a KPI? You can influence it, you can't control it. You can't control who buys, can you? But you can influence that. So we go back to process, the best chance you've got, okay? It's about internal attribution, in the sense that you focus on now. Can you control what happened last year? Can you change the sales from last year? No, you can't, you can learn from it. So all you can do is the now, and that's in sport. So if you, okay, you go to take a penalty, what's going through your mind in a big football game and a penalty? Don't. Yeah. What else? Yeah, but what's, going, what's sort of causing that? What appraisal is causing that? Because in a training session, you might not feel that way. The outcome. The, precisely. The fans, the expectation, the fan, all these things that are going through your mind, your appraisal. So you're so focused on, oh, if I miss, will I get another chance? And then, then what do you do to your technique? Your technique. So there's a process. So we want to be more process-driven, where you focus on giving some of the best chance to score the goal. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the same applies in work. Okay, you, you're on the phone to someone or whatever, uh, it's focusing on the now, the process, in adverse to, okay, will I get the sale, will I get the sale? The last person that called, it wouldn't go well all these things going through your mind, so be able to direct your attention, okay? Um, so the two main mindful protocols, going off piece a bit, um, that, that are used by mental health professionals, just to sort of give you an insight for some of you in mental health. One was developed by Kabat-Zinn, 19, well, Kabat-Zinn, MBSR, Mindful Base Stretch Reduction. And it's a huge body of evidence behind it, and extensively studied in the USA. MBSR derives from Buddhist philosophy. Cutting a long story short. And you've got MBCT, which is developed by Siegel, Teasdale, and Williams. According to Siegel, Teasdale, Williams, MBCT blends mindfulness with CBT and is primarily used in application of patient depression. So if you're a therapist and you're considering using 
then you might want to sort of look at the work that these guys have done if you haven't already done so. Okay, and it's quite interesting. So, okay. So according to these, they'll uh, mindful to help people with depression, anxiety. In the relationship, they have their thoughts to be able to emotionally regulate and reduce rumination. Okay, so the stewing of their thoughts in there. Um, MBC, MBSI and MBCT are carefully designed programs, but it's very similar and they contrast a lot too. Okay. Um, the ability to react instinctively and expediently to threatening situations is thought to be linked to evolutionary development. Not only triggering reactions in sympathetic nervous system, but our cognitive process as well, with the objective to activate appropriate behavior. So is my behavior in proportion to the situation? What do I mean by that? Evolutionary history? What do you think I might be meaning by that? Well, I mean, many, many years ago, when you had, we didn't have shelter like we've got now, you were open to the elements, okay? So you had prey and predator. So, okay, um, from that point of view, you, you see a predator in the background. What's your reaction? You're going to fight, flight, freeze mode. Uh, but what might one do? Well, you might run, you might throw a spear back, or you might fight back. Is that a reasonable hypothesis? Like you're in danger. Now, we don't have those dangers now, but if you know, you're told, I want you to go see HR, what's the impending danger? Threatening your job standards and positions. And what's the problem with that? It might not be. But, but, even, but what might the problem if the job is threatened? If you lose your job, what might be the issue with that be? Yeah. Finance, your health, your house, family. And what else and what else and what else? The land of what if? And then you go up and see HR and everything that sort of you've been sort of ruminating over is that you're actually getting a pay rise. Good luck with that, by the way. But the point being is that, you know, it may be that, but it may not be that. But either way, for you, for the course of one's day, you in this fight, flight, freeze mode, in survival mode. Because you know, you've been driving in the car and you get caught up in a traffic jam and you're frustrated. You're angry because you're going to be late, you could get fired. Then you get a letter coming in from you know, a bill, you think, goodness me, I'm going to pay that. And then you come home and you've got you know, family problems as well, and, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. And all these things really um, trigger the reactions to the sympathetic nervous system. And you sort of turn the tap on, don't you? Full blast. And, you know, your perfect behavior, then all of a sudden someone asks you a question and what do you do? You probably react out of proportion to what they've asked. So you scream, you know, or you run away. So when you go see HR and before you knock on the door, you start sprinting outside the building or you go in there armed and, you know, is that a really good place? So our behavior then is not in proportion to the situation, is it? So if you're held up in traffic, is there really any point screaming and shouting and telling everybody else off? Is that going to do any good? Okay. Um, if, for example, you know, your plane's delayed. If, for example, these things are happening in life that aren't undermining them, they're big things, but can you see how sometimes you know, we can make an appropriate choice? How we behave. So the way you might respond to someone or react to someone. Okay. And this can be useful for that, can't it, you know, in that respect. So the effects of stress, by the way, let me sort of go into stress, because stress is not a good thing. Uh, chronic, long-term stress is not good. So we're going to go across and, and, and divert a bit um, and sort of touch on the effects of stress. Okay, the effects of stress hormone elevated cortisol into people learning and memory to start with. So if you're under a lot of stress, there's a lot of negative, there's a lot of literature that there's a lot of negative effects on physical health. It increases risk for depression, mental health as well. High levels of stress. So putting your staff under a lot of stress is not good. Okay, because all it's gonna do is make them more prone to pathology and underperform. Okay? Uh, research by Kim Feldman uh, 215 suggests that stress affects the hippocampus. Uh, and cortisol can potentially damage the hippocampus negatively uh, if they hippocampi and production of cells and structure. So there is research around that. But why is that significant? Because atrophy, according to uh, Apostolova, 
Uh, atrophy of the hippocampus is a correlation to several psychopathologies, such as psychosis, depression, and is prevalent in Alzheimer's. Stress has a correlation to atrophy of the hippocampus. So one is not implying or suggesting that one will cause the other, uh, but if stress and his research suggests that atrophy, the hippocampus, hippocampi is one of the so right as a correlation to psychopathology, um, then stress is a correlation to atrophy. You sort of and obviously there's a lot of research to be done in that area, and I'm not an expert, clinical expert in that area, and I'm not a medical person. But if you do the research and do the reading, you start to realise that you know stress can be can be damaging. So for the therapist in the group and, and those who are going down that path, you might want to read on that and see stress and hippocampus damage, um, because a lot of research there suggests that. Uh, people who meditate have high grey areas in the hippocampi. How do I know that? Because I did the dissertation. <laughs> and on my dissertation, I did a lot of reading and, and learning. And I realised, so my research by Murakami, uh, medit people who meditate have high grey areas in the hippocampi size. So maybe there could be a case for meditation and increasing uh, neurons in the hippocampi. Um, according to Luders, high volume of grey area in the region of the hippocampi, left and right subiculum in people who meditated for a significant period of time compared to non meditators. So they're taking non meditators, they meditate. People who meditate have higher volumes of grey area. Uh, research by Chimbrowski suggests subiculum has an integral role of flux of information processed in the hippocampi, and amongst other functions, it's important in how people respond to stress. So the size of the subiculum has a correlation with memory. The bigger the volume, the better the memory. So, you know, you look at the research, you can make, you know, six and a half to one or the other really of it, but the reality is there seems to be a pattern emerging here that people who meditate um, do have. Um, now, you know, you could make an argument against it too if you really wanted to, but it's worth sort of looking into that and thinking, oh, actually, you know what, um, the, 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 the meditation uh, has, has a useful um, brain from a brain structural point of view, uh, you know, uh, going forward. So, you know, you look at the research, um, people who meditate over long periods of time do demonstrate a reduction in neurodegeneration. But, you know, other points must be considered. Uh, gender, genetics, environmental experience and pathology. So nothing's 100% by the way, and that's at least my interpretation of the literature, where Yes, one can demonstrate, show the hypothesis, but equally in saying that you could argue, okay, well, what other factors that we're going to consider in, 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 in the research? So, but it's promising, isn't it? And it's worth investigating, absolutely. Uh, and, and equally, you know, in the future, we've got better biomarkers, like I said, heart rate variance and cortisol levels, MRI scanning, we'll know more. But, you know, I think the great thing about mindfulness, it's not really intrusive, is it? It was done in a way where, you know, if you're okay to sit there and, 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 and experience it, fine. If you don't want to do it, then you don't do it. End off. So you're not sort of, I think it's not intrusive. Okay, if it's done in a way where you sort of permissive. It does appear to have a correlation with great density and volume regions in the hippocampi and homeostatic regulation of stress response. Okay. But, you know, like all things, there are limitations. Um, and conscious interventions have limitations. Mindfulness can potentially help with the mind's automatic attention regulation. So, okay, telling yourself not to be afraid. Telling yourself not to be afraid of the HR person. Okay? Is that going to work? But perhaps you sit down and just and breathe and let that pass. So unconscious regulation, does that make sense? In adverse to telling yourself not to we're trying to reappraise and reappraisal by the way is only useful if what you're reappraising has or well, the context of your reappraisal is, is important in, in what you're reappraising if that makes sense so for example you might reappraise you know if you say i don't care about this job anyway but you do care about the job is that a useful reappraisal do you think so maybe a more useful reappraisal might be, well actually I've lost a job before and I've got one again anyway, so there's a good chance that there's that, you know, 
Like using an idea. Suppression is no good. So Freud was right. You know, the more we suppress things, the worse it is. Um, so, so being the coach and telling someone to you know just get on with it, you know, go away and think of solution, and suppress what's going on in their mind, probably not a good thing. Now you might not be the person to help them. You might say, well, actually, if you consider going to get help for that problem you got, it could be mental health. Find out between coach. Maybe they have got something going on. Maybe they do. But mindfulness helps us create a more experiential view of the sense of self and the versus static self. It can be more fluent and balanced sense of self, which can assist in regulation of emotion, governance of behaviours, which can potentially have benefits during and beyond meditation. The more you do it, the more you take away that sort of sense of self, or more healthy sense of self. So there's two basic approaches, experiential learning and meditative practice, and experiential practice of mindfulness involves focusing on awareness, observation while engaged with an activity. Mindful exercises serve to quieten the mind and diffuse thoughts and feelings by focusing on the present moment. One thing I would say, by the way, from this point of view, is some people have got health anxiety, and why do when people have got health anxiety? Because mindfulness is focused a lot on the body sensation. And sometimes they've got health anxiety, what do you think they do if they sort of focus on the body? What might happen? They might get afraid, they might think, is that sort of pain I've got in my knee or whatever? That's not undermining it, because it might be something they need to check out. All things being well, they've got to check out, they're okay. Um, you can maybe receive the, the mindfulness exercise, but you can say focus on the sound. Because it might be distressing for the person to focus on the body sensation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so it might be a focus on the body, focus on the sound, because if you focus on that sensation of the body, you might be really afraid or anxious of that feeling you got in your hand. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now we shall do uh, a process. What, 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 is everyone okay to do a process? Okay, we're, we're all good. If at any point during the process uh, you want to get up and and, and move. <laughs> no, precisely, exactly. and that's what mindfulness should be like. You know, yeah. if at any point you feel uncomfortable or you feel that you know you don't want to carry on proceeding, that's entirely up to you. This will give you a taste of it. Okay, so you're nice and safe, make yourself in a safe position, in a secure environment. Okay, just make yourself comfortable now. Um, as you make yourself comfortable, you decide you want to make yourself comfortable. Just. Notice your posture. Okay. If you prefer to close your eyes, you can. It's totally up to you. If it's safe to close your eyes. <laughs> and just adjust your posture. And if you get into a comfortable posture, with your feet in a comfortable position, your legs and shoulders and back and just releasing any tension from the neck and breathing naturally normally and bringing your arms in a comfortable position perhaps the back straight and let the shoulders just find a comfortable position And as you do that, you can perhaps focus on the sound in the background or sensations in the body. So getting out of your own head and focus on the breathing. So just focus on the breathing. And let go of events of today and tomorrow for now. Be present in the breathing. whatever you got in mind for tomorrow or today or yesterday, just put it to one side for now. Slow the mind down. As you slow the mind down, be aware of the breathing and the fragmented thoughts in the background and just let them flow. And breathe air in any areas of tension in the body and let them flow. 
So if you've got the tension in the neck, you just breathe air into the area of tension or the knee or the muscles of the legs or and letting it flow. Awareness of any sensations. And perhaps you're thinking about the past few days in your mind, things that have been unfair. And allow yourself to bring the experience of the feeling the memory brings of that unfairness. And open to experiencing without changing resistance. Notice feelings in the body, any thoughts. As you notice the thoughts and the feelings in the body, hold the thoughts in the space of awareness. So it's just a bit like when you stub your toe or hit your funny bone, and you bring the thoughts into the awareness, like when you stub the toe or hit the funny bone, have a physical sensation. And as you bring the thoughts in awareness, just focus on the narrative. What's the story? Is there blame? Victim? Are you trying to change what's happened? Is it a recurring pattern? Is there a theme? Just explore the inner dialogue and holding your thoughts in the sensations or the space of awareness in the same way you hold sensations. Just aware, just noticing them as they arrive. Past rid of mind and dissolve back in the awareness. Explore the relationship between the feeling and the thoughts that arrive and how this reflects on your body sensations. What happens to you, your strong feelings of, situ of the situation, if you just stay in the flux of the body sensations? Observe the whole cascade as if you're watching a movie, fully present with what is going on, fully aware but not taking it as entirely real, just the images. Experiences that pass through. The experiences that pass through the mind, this too shall pass. And just remind yourself that you can return to this mindfulness awareness whenever you are having a strong feeling during the day perhaps a stressful situation or an unpleasant personal reaction. Instead of being carried away by the feelings and the stories that arise with them, so just reconnecting with the body and the breath and see what happens if you're just mindfully aware of this experience as it unfolds in real life, in real time. One always has a choice, no matter how strong the experience might appear. Even if it feels like it's completely taking over us, it's always up to us to choose how we respond in every moment, in every situation. So as you make your way back to the here and now, in your own time, in your own pace, just gradually opening your eyes. Everyone okay? How did you find the experience? Good. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is the one, one meditation I did with the, the person I spoke to you about before when I did that sort of transcript where I actually told her we did the uh, meditation because there was a lot going through her mind and she was struggling to regulate. So as a way of emotionally regulating, um, I sort of introduced to do a similar script like that, we just you know breathe and stay with it, and no need to change anything at this point. And before we sort of break away for lunchtime, we'll do another 
uh, gentle meditation, which is quite useful too. Uh, and is everyone okay to do another meditation? So if you just want to close your eyes again, be comfortable closing your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes. Uh, and if it's safe for you to close your eyes. Um, now, once again, just, just posture, just adjusting your posture and making yourself nice and comfortable. Comfortably alert. So, adjusting your feet and your back and just your shoulders, neck, and just making yourself nice and comfortable. And as you make yourself nice and comfortable, and you adjust your posture. You might bring to mind a person in your life. It could be a grandparent. It could be a parent. It could be a best friend. It could be a partner. Anyone in your life who always makes you feel welcome and love no matter what you do. The sort of person that's always there for you. Warmly embracing you. And just evoke the feeling of what it's like to be loved unconditionally and welcome. Someone in the company of that person, you don't have to be anybody. You don't have to pretend. You can be yourself. There's no false pretenses here. You know you're not going to be judged. And it doesn't even matter if you make mistakes and say certain things. Just allow that warm feeling of love that you have in the presence of that person just spread for every cell of the body. So it'd be like soaking in a bath of warmth and love. And give that love to yourself unconditionally. Notice any resistances you might experience when you receive such an invitation. And just process it and accept what's comfortable for you. And soak in as much as you feel comfortable taking. Now bring to per mind the person close to you it could be a colleague at work. It could be a friend. It could be a family member. And extend that warm loving feeling towards them. Give them the lovely warm embrace and connect with sensations. And allow your heart to open to the experience of this lovely moment with a friend. And now, just take a moment to See if you can extend this warm heartness to someone you find mildly annoying. Someone you might dislike. Not so much, just moderately. For whatever reason is not clear to you. And remind yourself that everyone just wants to be loved and happy and safe and secure. No matter how confused that behavior might be, ultimately we all desire to be free from any harm and to be accepted and to be loved. And perhaps you can extend this sentiment and warm heartness to people you find difficult to deal with. You find this appreciation that they just want to be happy. They want to be loved, safe, and understand. Even though their behavior might seem erratic or they might seem to be confused or just feeling a sense of compassion for any inconvenience or any thing they may have caused, the anger and rage they might be in, wishing them well, wishing them clarity and wisdom, wish them to be content. And if you can take the next step and extend that sentiment to all people and beings and species and animals, whoever, whatever comes to mind, wish well. Wish people well and free 
from any harm. There's no need for you to sort of focus on one person or people specifically. Just be with it and expand the feeling as you reconnect with body sensations. Somehow you're radiating light and love and acceptance and resting in that sensation for a little while. And before we end the practice, Note to yourself, you can invoke this feeling of love for yourself and others in challenging situations in everyday life. If there is a situation where you notice you have any thoughts of anger, resentment, regret, just be compassionate towards yourself. If you make a mistake or maybe you handle a situation like you think you should handle it, maybe you said something to someone you think you shouldn't have said, or it's okay. Just extend that loving feeling towards yourself. There's always the chance to do better next time. And in your own time, in your own pace, just come back to here and now. Okay. So, you know, doing the love, love kindness, and there's variations of the meditations out there, it's quite useful because sometimes people say, well, I don't want to be love and kind to someone for whatever reason. But equally in saying that, if you hold on resentment, who's the resentment har harming? Because you, it's like trying to pick up a hot coal and throw it at somebody else, isn't it? It'll burn you before it burns them. So in one sense, it might even be neutral. But in one sense, it might be they don't want to do it. It's fine, you have to do it. You have to force someone to do mindfulness. You have to do meditation. But it's quite useful for them to develop the brain. And we know, obviously, that if we can be more compassionate towards ourselves uh, to begin with, then we're going to be more productive in one respect. But that sort of brings a close to, to that segment of the, of the course before I we break for lunch. Is there any questions before we sort of have a, we're sort of good to go? Apart from, can we go to lunch now, please? <laughs> yeah, love and kindness. <laughs> I want my lunch. <laughs> um, but you know, you, like I said before, it's material. I, I know, obviously, you know, um, some of you are doing the, the, the mindfulness program uh, with me. Um, but in saying that, even if you're not doing it and you want some information on it, then, you know, I'll send you a few meditations and whatever I can signpost you. Um, you know, to help you in your journey. But I always think it's about using it and extending it to your own remit in one respect. And I'm always very clear about that. I think that when you do mindfulness about, you know, depending on your professional experience, one should attach it to their professional experience. So a teacher might use it to help, you know, students who've got a bit of exam anxiety. Um, but equally in saying that, anxiety shouldn't be treated lightly. And, you know, if the child says that they feel anxious, then it's always best for them to see the appropriate person for that. But all things being well, if it is uh, subclinical, then mindfulness, I see no reason why it can't be administered. And, you know, I think for me, if you look at schools, um, in one respect, it's almost like we, we, the mind and body are cut off in, in one respect when you think about it. So, for example, the young person might start school for the first time ever, and they might say, i got a sore tummy. And you as a parent might think they're saying that because you think they want the day off for whatever reason, but the reality is they could just be anxious. They might not be anxious. They might want the day off but it might be worth exploring and finding a little bit more about that, um, if that sort of makes sense. Because the mind and body is connected, that we know uh, with all the research that's been going on. So on that note, we'll break for lunch, because I'm sure your mind and body's connected and you probably have your stomach growling now. <laughs> and then again, you probably ate enough last night, and then it's the following week. That we'll soon see. So, till half one, is that okay? Yes, friend. Yeah.